All right, Ruth Esther for beginners. Ruth Esther for beginners. And uh, this is a uh, one lesson, uh, one lesson take on, on the single book. In other words, we're gonna do all of Ruth uh, today. And next week we'll do the book, of, uh, the book of Esther and the subtitle of this book, Chords of Love, Chords of Love. There are only uh, two books in a total of 66 books in the Bible that have women as the main characters. Of course, uh, women like Sarah and Hagar, Rebecca and Rachel, Miriam, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Priscilla, the apostle Paul's friend and coworker, all of these and uh, more played important roles in the coming and the earthly ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have a lot of prominent women I mean, from the very beginning uh, of the Bible. However, only the lives of Ruth and Esther were preserved in inspired books that uh, bear, their, bear their names. So in this brief course, we're going to focus our attention on uh, one important lesson that we can draw from the study of each of these uh, books. And we begin uh, with the book of Ruth, a book of Ruth takes place during the end of the time of the judges, before the 12 tribes of Israel were united under a single king. That would be around 1200 to about 1100 uh, BC. Some scholars believe that Samuel uh, may have been the author of this uh, short book. The word Ruth uh, or the name Ruth means friendly she was a Moabite woman from Moab, a country that was east of Israel. Today we call it Jordan. These people were descended from Moab. Moab was the son of Lot and his eldest daughter, uh, who was conceived after their escape from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. If you're wondering how, what's the lineage there? That's the lineage. As we quickly learn from the opening chapter, Ruth is a woman of faith and courage. And through various challenges, we see how her love for her widowed mother-in-law grows in strength and quality. All of us are in different types of relationships, which are at various stages. And we usually want these relationships to work whether they are family relationships, marital relationships, professional, personal relationships, friendships. And so the book of Ruth reveals five essential ties that have the ability to bind us securely to another person in a successful relationship. And I call these the cords of love uh, from the um, uh, proverb Proverb, uh, excuse me, from the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, uh, chapter four, where he says, and if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. And then he says, a cord of three strands is not quickly uh, torn apart. And so in my view, there are not just three strands, but five. There are five strands or five cords of love that keep relationships together and these chords are described eloquently in the book of Ruth. And so the book of Ruth is a, a wonderful story of the love and devotion of a young woman who becomes a widow and she takes care of her mother-in-law who is also a widow at great cost to herself. And in this short book, we're gonna see the five chords of love that help bind these two people together in a loving relationship despite many uh, obstacles. And so the first chord that we discover uh, as we begin to read the book is the chord of kindness. And so open your Bibles to uh, Ruth and uh, we're going to begin reading the first several uh, verses. It says, now it came about in the days when the judges governed uh, that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem of Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. 
Ephrathites of Bethlehem in Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died and she was left with her two sons. They took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of the one was Orpah and the name of the other Ruth. And they lived there about 10 years. Then both Malon and Chilion also died and the, women, uh, and the woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the land of Moab, for she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her uh, two daughters-in-law, go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, no, but we will surely return with you to your people. But Naomi said, return my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Return my daughters, go for I am too old to have a husband. And if I said I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you, for the hand of the Lord has gone forth uh, against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Then she said, behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Well, stop there. We want you to notice that Naomi, the mother-in-law, let both of her daughters go home. She realized, uh, she released them rather from their family obligations so that they could start new lives back in uh, Moab where they came from. Now, the custom of those days was that they remain with her to help her, but she chose to sacrifice herself for the good of her two young daughters-in-law. Shared interests, beauty, intelligence, wealth, power, these things are usually what attract a person to another in the beginning. However, kindness is what gives a relationship staying power. In the everyday working out of a relationship, little and large acts of kindness are what actually build a relationship, not money, not looks, not even how smart you are. Conversely, lack of kindness, such as being impolite or inconsiderate or thoughtless or stingy with compliments or kind gestures, these are things that lead to boredom and eventual uh, separation. And so kindness is the first cord necessary to secure two people together in any uh, relationship, whether it be marital relationship or a business or a friendship, kindness is the first cord of love. The second cord of love mentioned in the book of Ruth is the cord of loyalty, the cord of loyalty. Let's continue reading about this particular cord. It says, but Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me and worse, if anything but death parts uh, you and uh, me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So they both went until they came to Bethlehem. And when they had come to Bethlehem, all the city was stirred because of them. And the women said, this, is this Naomi, Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi? since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. So Naomi returned and with her Ruth the Moabitess 
and daughter-in-law who returned from the land of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of a barley harvest. And so in here we see the second chord of love, which is loyalty. Uh, Ruth's life and uh, loyalty was sworn to her husband and his family. And to that family, she remained loyal. She wanted to live where they lived. She wanted to become as they were. And more importantly, she wanted to worship as they worshiped. She saw that her life changed for the better as a pagan Moab woman who married a Jew who was a believer in God. And she wanted to remain loyal to this way of godly living and to these uh, godly people. Even if it meant giving up her chance at remarriage, for Ruth, being a widow among God's people was better than being married among pagans. The loss of her husband did not shake her loyalty to his family and beliefs. Trust, loyalty, faithfulness, perseverance, these are pillars of a lasting relationship. You know, each time a crisis or an argument or a disappointment or a sin fails to destroy a relationship, that relationship grows much stronger. I tell you, nothing strengthens relationships more dynamically than a show of loyalty at a critical moment. When I see my wife or my friend or my family or church members or business associates choose to stay loyal to our relationship when temptation or trial or other options come along, it makes me rejoice and it enables me to actually feel the cords of love binding me together. Isn't it great when someone sticks with you during a difficult moment? Uh, even when you act unseemly, even when your own actions are not as good as you, know, you would like them to be, you fail. But your people, your friends, your family, your wife, your partner, whoever it is, they stick with you through those difficult moments. That show of loyalty uh, is an is a absolute binding cord that binds you together in a longer lasting relationship. Cord number three is a, the cord of hard work. The cord of hard work. In Ruth chapter two, we begin reading about what um, Ruth had to go through in order to maintain the relationship uh, with her uh, mother-in-law. So we read together. Now Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after one in whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, go, my daughter. So she departed and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, may the Lord be with you. And they said to him, may the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? The servant in charge of the reapers replied, she's the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the land of Moab. And she said, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. Thus she came and has remained from the morning until now. She has been sitting in the house for a little while. Then Boaz said to Ruth, listen carefully, my daughter, do not go and glean in another field. Furthermore, do not go on from this one, but stay here with my maids. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Indeed, I have commanded the servants not to touch you. When you are thirsty, go to the water jars and drink from what the servants draw. Then she fell on her face, bowing down to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Boaz replied to her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me and how you left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and came to a people that you did not previously know. May the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. Then she said, 
I have found favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and indeed you have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your other maidservants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here that you may eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and she served her roasted grain and she ate and was satisfied and had some left. When she rose to glean, Boaz commanded his servants saying, let her glean among, even among the sheaves and do not insult her. Also you shall purposefully pull out for her some grain from the bundles and leave it that she may glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned and it was about an epoch of barley. She took it up and went into the city and her mother-in-law saw that she had gleaned. She also took it out and gave Naomi what she had left after she was satisfied. Her mother-in-law then said to her, where did you glean today and where did you work? May he who took notice of you be blessed. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed of the Lord who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and to the dead. Again, Naomi said to her, the man is our relative. He is one of our closest relatives. Then Ruth the Moabitess said, furthermore, he said to me, you should stay close to my servants until they have finished all my harvest. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with his maids so that others do not fall upon you in another field. So she stayed close by the maids of Boaz in order to glean until the end of the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. And she lived with her uh, mother-in-law. So in the story of Ruth, we see that her relationship with Naomi caused her to actually work very hard. They had to earn a living, they had to eat. And so she served as a hired hand. And as such, she had no guarantee of payment. She had no guarantee of uh, protection. Now, the parallel in today's relationships is obvious. You've got to work at it. You've got to work at it. Whether it's a marriage or a friendship, you've got to work at it. You know, many partnerships, marriages and friendships fail simply because of laziness. People think that, you know, relationships flourish and nourish themselves, but they don't. You've got to continually care for them much like you care for a garden or a car. My mother uh, used to say that a relationship is like a fire in a fireplace. You have to continually add wood and stir the ashes to keep the flame going. In a relationship, the best way to do this are the following couple of ideas. First of all, communicate honestly and deeply with each other on a regular basis. You wanna, you wanna build a relationship? You've got to work at it. What kind of work do you have to do? Well, communication, honest communication. For example, have regular heart to heart talks. So many times we let things go by or we swallow our feelings and resentments. And in doing so, we allow anger and resentment to boil. A good, honest talk from time to time is liberating and joyful as well. When we really speak to each other from the heart, it clears the air and it helps us to go forward in our relationship with enthusiasm. Another way to work at our relationship is to do things together, work together, play together, serve together, learn together, explore together, build together, dream together. The natural and easy thing to do is to do our own thing, whatever that is. Why? Because it's easier. I come home, I drop my briefcase, I put on my comfortable clothes, and I say, yeah, hey, you having a good day, good boy, I'll see you later, and off to the garage I go, because in the garage I've got my workbench and I got my toys, I have my stuff, you know. Call me when supper is ready. And then after supper is, uh, well, the new, for me anyways, the newspaper, you know on the tablet or just the, you know, just the regular newspaper, it's the newspaper. And then later on, maybe it's, well, it's my quiet time. I've got to do my Bible reading. I want my quiet time now. And then maybe a little TV and say, you ready to go to bed? Yeah, okay, well, good night. That's not working at it. We can't have it both ways. 
We can't have intimacy and the rewards that come with a good relationship, but continually ignore that relationship in order to do our own thing. Relationships work because people go from my own thing to our thing. The work comes from the trial and error of figuring out what our thing is. Now, don't get me wrong, this doesn't mean that we abandon all of the activities that we like to do by ourselves, I didn't say that. But it does mean, however, that we make room for some new things that build our relationship and not just build ourselves. Another thing to do if you're working at it, share spiritual things. Every relationship improves with Christ. Every relationship improves with Christ. Business relationships open up with Christ. Friendships go deeper when Christ is part of the relationship. Marriages solidify when the spirit of Christ enters the relationship. Here are some stats from an older study once done to measure the effects of religion on marriage. Out of the couples where there was no spiritual life whatsoever, you know, the husband, the wife, neither one of them had any spiritual life, no prayer life, no church life, nothing, no spiritual discussion or interest at all. The rate of divorce, one out of two. You often hear that, you know, the rate of divorce in the United States, almost 50%. However, what they don't talk about, you know, uh, the news, with, with the numbers they don't give you are in a relationship where one partner uh, is a person of faith. You know, they, they, they practice faith, they go to church, they pray, they read their Bible, whatever, you know, the, one partner practices faith. Even if the other one doesn't, one partner practices faith, the rate goes up to one out of 40. And in a relationship where both partners are actively involved in their faith, pursuing a faith, the rate goes to one out of 400 uh, divorce. Uh, sharing spiritual things is not simply saying we're Christians or we're believers. Sharing spiritual things means to be actively involved in spiritual things like we worship together, we pray together, we serve together, we learn together. You know, the great encouragement for relationships based on Christ is the fact that uh, these have hope not only for this life, but also for the next life to come as well. Let's uh, briefly review then what we've learned so far in this uh, chapter. The third chord of love is hard work. And the best way to work at a relationship, as I said, communicate honestly, do things together, share, your spiritual lives together. You know, the easiest thing to do in a relationship is to take each other for granted. Why? Well, because we're busy, or because we're tired, or because we're selfish, or because we're distracted. However, people who enjoy successful relationships do so because they have invested time and effort into the relationship just like every other successful thing in their lives. If you're going to be a success at uh, whatever, playing uh, softball or uh, shooting hoops or whatever, you've got to practice. What makes us think that we're going to be successful at marriage with no practice, with no effort, like it's supposed to happen all by itself? Well, no, it doesn't. You can't put two sinful people together in one relationship and think that everything is just going to work out by itself. You have to work at it. All right, the fourth chord, fourth chord of love is the chord of patience. The chord of patience. In Ruth uh, chapter three, verses one to four, and then I, I skip over to verse 12. So it says in chapter three, it says, then Naomi, her mother-in-law said to her, my daughter, shall I not seek security for you that it may be well with you? Now is not Boaz our kinsman? with whose maids you were. Behold the winnow's barley at the threshing floor tonight. Wash yourself therefore and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. It shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies and you shall go and uncover his feet 
and lie down and then he will tell you uh, what you shall do. And a little further down in verse 12, it says now, this is uh, Boaz speaking after he's spoken to her, he's woken up and so on and so forth. And he says, now it is true, I am a close relative. However, there is a relative uh, closer uh, than I. And here the discussion was that uh, by uncovering his uh, feet, uh, Boaz wakes up. She uh, mentions to him that he is uh, you know, her close relative. Then uh, he has the right to take her uh, in marriage. And then here he says, well, that's true, but there's a uh, one person who's even a closer relative than I. And that sets up you know, the next scene. Well, as far as this is concerned, the only way that Ruth could guarantee a better and stable life for herself was for her to marry in that society. The custom at the time, however, was that whoever married her now had to promise that their firstborn son together would inherit her dead husband's land. That was the idea of the redeemer to buy back. In, in reading on, we find out that uh, there is a closer relative than Boaz who refuses to marry Ruth. And when he gives up his right, Boaz steps up, steps forward, and he takes Ruth as his wife. Of course, uh, in those days, few men wanted the responsibility of raising a child to carry on another man's name and inherit another man's property. And when you think about it, Ruth, uh, she was not uh, a young virgin anymore. Uh, she was a liability as far as finance and property were concerned. And thus she didn't have much hope to get married, but she was patient. She was willing to follow Naomi's advice. The hope that both these women had was that the richest man in the area would not only marry her and provide an heir for her dead husband, but would do this at personal, financial, and social risk to himself. Think about it. He, 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 he could have had anyone. Why take as wife a poor Moabite widow? And so this episode shows us that the best partnerships work together patiently for the good of the relationship. I've uh, learned from experience to listen to my wife's advice, especially when her counsel makes me upset. I've learned that not all matters and obstacles in a relationship can be settled in one day. You know, this idea of we got to have closure. Uh, we go for closure and we talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, 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 yak, 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 to get closure. Well, you know, some things don't get resolved in a day. You know, uh, my wife used to say at about 4.30 in the morning, you know, I think we can save some of this for tomorrow, darling. <laughs> you know, I, want to, I just want to settle it all now. I want it to be over now. You know, I want closer now. You know? And she said, it's all right, get a little sleep. We, we, we can manage to close tomorrow. I've also learned, and I mentioned before, when two flawed, imperfect, sinful people are in a relationship, there are going to be offenses. I mean, it's a sure thing. There are going to be offenses, 100% certain. I've also learned that patience is often the ingredient in a relationship that maintains balance when things get difficult. If loyalty is the rope that binds you closer together, patience is the rope that keeps you in the relationship when all the other ropes give way. Patience is the safety rope when the others fail. Patience is the willingness to go on despite discomfort. It is the willingness to wait. It is the ability to carry a heavy load without discouragement. It is the desire to forgive and make allowances for other people. Patience gives the benefit of the doubt and chooses to understand and work with the weakness and the failings of someone we are in a relationship with. Pa patience, doesn't, patience doesn't say, I can't do this anymore. You see that all the time. You know? I can't do this anymore. And my answer to that is, why not? Why can't you do this anymore? Are you suffering so badly that you, you know, 
Are you so little invested that you're ready to throw it all away? No one is born with patience. Patience is something we learn one situation at a time. However, patience always pays off with a reward of some kind. For example, Ruth's patience led her to a loving and kind husband. The true reward of patience, however, is that through patience we grow in our ability to love and to hope and to be wise. You know, impatient people, they make mistakes. They ruin relationships. They rarely grow into emotional and spiritual uh, maturity. Why? They're not willing to wait. They want everything now. They want things to be fixed now. They want to fix her now, or she wants to fix him now. That's not the way, it's not the way it works. Patience is what enables us to love despite the unlovely things we eventually see in our partners. And we all know that eventually we begin to see the weaknesses and the failings of our partners, of our spouses. Patience is what helps us to maintain a relationship while we work through the differences that we have with our partners. Of all the chords, it's the one most responsible for keeping relationships together over a great number of years. The chord of patience. And then finally, the fifth chord. The fifth chord is faith in God. Faith in God. In Ruth chapter four, beginning in verse 13, we read the following. It says, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Then the women said to Naomi, blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today, and may his name become famous in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of, you, of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. The neighbor women gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. To Perez was born Hezron, and to Hezron was born Ram, and to Ram Aminadab. Uh, uh, and to Aminadab was born Nashon, and to Nashon Salmon, and to Salmon was born Boaz, and to Boaz Obed, and to Obed was born Jesse, and to Jesse uh, David. And so from the very beginning, no one could know, and no one could have known what God's plan was with all of this, that Ruth and Boaz would produce a child who would be the grandfather of the great King David. David, who became the greatest king of Israel, the one who wrote the beautiful book of Psalms and who would be in the direct lineage of Jesus through his earthly father, Joseph. Ruth's faith in God began with Naomi and then the man she married, Boaz, and each entered into a relationship with one another based on faith. Ruth with Naomi, based on faith. Boaz with Ruth, based on faith. And their faith was rewarded beyond expectations. Their greatest hope was to have a good marriage with children and grandchildren. I mean, isn't that what we all want? Their reward of faith, however, was that in addition to these things, they also secured a direct relationship with a future king and the future Messiah. All relationships we know end in failure or death, without exception. As one speaker has said, all marriages end at the divorce court or the funeral home. It's kind of discouraging when you think of it like that. The first four chords of love can't protect you against death. However, those relationships that have as a basis 
faith in God and trust in Christ have an element, have a chord that others do not have. These people have the hope that their relationships will transcend this world and continue into the next. This reality and promise of God is what gives a relationship between Christian spouses or friends and family an extra measure of joy and hope and confidence. You know, at funerals, we often say, we'll see each other again. You know, the deceased and the family and the friends, we'll see each other again. And that's not just wishful thinking, that's the truth. We will see each other again. Of course, in a different context, different body, but we will see each other again. And that's a great, great comfort. And so adding the cord of faith to our relationships closes the circle of eternity between ourselves and other believers, no matter how we are related to them. And so there they are, the five cords of love that promote successful and happy relationships as seen in the uh, book of uh, Ruth. Show them once more. The cord of kindness builds up a relationship. The cord of loyalty binds it strongly together. The cord of hard work breaks the boredom cycle. The cord of patience balances the relationship in troubled times. The cord of faith breaks, uh, uh, brings a relationship into another dimension. So you may be thinking, where's the cord of love? You kept thinking, the cord of love, how come there isn't a cord of love? Isn't that necessary for a happy and lasting relationship? Absolutely, yes, love is necessary and love is there. I've just described love to you. This is what true love looks like when it is present and being expressed by two individuals in any relationship. Love is kindness and loyalty and hard work and patience and faith in God. That's what love is in a relationship. When you take all the five strands together, they produce love. My prayer is that these cords of love will surround and bless each of your relationships. God bless each of you and each of your relationships now and in the future as you pursue to produce the cords of love that will bind you with your loved one forever and ever again. All right, well that's the uh, book of Ruth, uh, little assignment, and that will be to read the book of Esther. Uh, we don't have time to read all of the books. I may read some passages, but if you read the book of Esther, you'll be prepared for the lesson next week. All right, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention.